Now we're going to take our tour through the chapters of the textbook, starting with chapter one. Of course, the introduction is chapter zero. And here we think about uh, subjective experience as the fundamental challenge for science, not just science of psychology, but really all forms of science. So hopefully you've seen the Matrix movie. If you haven't, I'm sorry for uh, ruining it for you. Uh, so the most impactful scene in the movie, when I saw this in the movie theater, when the movie came out, you know, just absolutely blew me away you realize everything that you had just seen was virtual. It wasn't real, okay? Um, and it's just this kind of simulation, the matrix. And this is a possibility for our very real world right now, okay? Uh, it's reported that Elon Musk and several other uh, people who are kind of prominent people who, you know, Maybe they're not the most sane people in the world, but they're reasonably kind of, you know, successful people uh, are entertaining this idea and thinking, yeah, this is this is very likely. This is very probable. Of course, the famous philosopher Rene Descartes came up with this very important principle of cogito ergo sum. I think and therefore I am. OK, and it's the primacy of the subjective experience. This is all we have. It's absolutely true, right? All I know is what my senses have told me, what I'm experiencing right now. I could be hooked up to computers simulating everything that I'm experiencing, right? Uh, and, and I wouldn't know because everything I experience is processed by my brain. I don't even know if my brain exists, right? Uh, everything comes through that subjective lens. I don't think that that's very plausible because I've actually tried to create simulations uh, for my models of the brain that I work on. Um, and it's really, really hard. Okay. Uh, people underestimate that. And if you look at these video games, you know, there's glitches all over the place. So subjectivism is primary and uh, science fundamentally has to come, come to grips with that challenge. What do we need for science to proceed? Some kind of consensus. This is how we bridge the gap between objective reality that we think might be out there if you choose to believe in it um, and, and the subjective experience is we say, well, if I see the same thing that you see, and in fact, everybody else is seeing the same thing, then maybe we can come to an agreement. I have no idea what this poster is supposed to indicate, but anyway, I'm taking it as <laughs> different people seeing the same thing. Um, in science, the, the coin of the realm is reproducibility. Can you replicate or reproduce uh, the same experiment and get the same result over and over again? If you can, then it seems like, well, it wasn't just, you know, my subjective, weird, fluky experience. It's actually something real, um, something that exists outside of my experience. And so that's, that's the important, uh, you know, cornerstone of science. Um, and you may have heard that there's a currently a replication crisis, uh, that people are not able to replicate earlier studies. And that's a crisis because of that critical role that reproducibility and re replicability play in science. Um, and so some of these results may have kind of, you know, been lucky outcomes. And when the people published them, you know, it was kind of like, oh, that's exciting. That's interesting. And they get all the fame and, you know, money and promotions. And so there's a bias in our way science works that favors producing and publishing, you know, kind of uh, unusual, interesting results. But other people try to, try to replicate them and they're like, eh, I'm not getting that to work. Um, and so uh, you really, uh, there is a lot of work these days trying to um, uh, make sure that those incentives, those biases in science are not dominating the field and that we can have a greater uh, faith in what we actually come up with as results. But, you know, consensus is very hard to come by, okay? Everybody's got their own subjective opinions. A lot of these subjective opinions are at variance with what we come up with in our scientific results. And um, there's also a lot of social pressure, as you can see here. And so, you know, there's, if you look at real science, it's actually far, 
from ideal or rational or, or kind of reasonable in any way, um, it's hard. It's really hard. And that's because we are subjective individuals. We're biased. We have a very strong uh, control uh, bias. We have a compression bias. We have all these different principles operating in our minds. And all of those things in some ways get, away, get in the way of kind of seeing the truth out there. Um, and, and so it's really, really hard to, to understand uh, and, and come up with some kind of objective reality. That's our big challenge for, for chapter one is to talk about how that all works and how we can actually piece together uh, a, a reasonable understanding of objective reality, uh, even though everybody is fundamentally subjective. In chapter two, we now look at the brain full on. Uh, it's all about the brain and every level from neurons all the way up to the whole circuitry of the brain uh, how everything's interconnected and again we'll see directly how compression contrast and control uh, come right out of the structure of the brain how the brain is fundamentally organized according to those principles um, and uh, we already kind of covered a bit about that and so this is also really interesting where we can kind of see how different information is processed in different parts of the brain in terms of signals originating at primary locations like the primary visual cortex, primary motor cortex, primary auditory cortex, etc. You can understand kind of the overall organization of the brain in terms of those uh, spreading kind of information coming out of those, radiating out of those anchor points. Chapter three, very fun chapter, of course, talking about consciousness, sleep, drugs, everything. Uh, what is it that, that allows us to be aware of our own thoughts? How is it that we have this conscious ability? Does that consciousness exist outside of the human mind? Is it, is it present in other animals? Uh, may, could it be present in computers? Uh, what's the story? Um, and so uh, we can tackle all those interesting problems. And we'll see that actually what we understood from the brain can actually tell us a lot about how consciousness might work. And I think there's actually a pretty good consensus among people who have thought hard about this, how it might actually work. And it, it's kind of surprising. We might, we might be further along than you might think in, in understanding how consciousness works. Uh, one of the interesting things we'll see, which I mentioned before, is that your frontal cortex kind of turns off the most during sleep. Here it is. This blue area is your frontal cortex falling asleep and turning off. Uh, and so a lot of the properties of dreams can be understood, in, as I said before, in terms of this kind of uh, state of lack of control, kind of dominating the patterns of activity in your brain, and therefore the kind of you know cats coming out to play or the mice coming out to play, um, whatever. Okay, uh, and then of course the same kinds of dynamics can happen during uh, certain kinds of drug use. Uh, it turns out like the psychedelic drugs mainly uh, have effects very similar in fact to dreaming and may operate in, in really the same way that the dream state operates. So essentially if you take LSD you're essentially creating a waking dream state. Um, and so really understanding dreams helps us understand drugs and we'll also look at all the other kinds of drugs and how what we know about the brain uh, uh, explains how these drugs work. And really drugs are just plugging into existing neural mechanisms in the brain. They're, that's That has to be how it works, that, that the only way they can kind of get a foothold in there is if they're doing something, changing some parameters that already exist in the brain. Uh, and so actually drugs do help us understand a lot about how the brain works. In chapter four, we're looking at perception. This is everything about contrast, compression, not so much about control, but a little bit. So here's an interesting, you know, picture. Do you notice anything interesting about this? No, you don't. Uh, you don't. But what if I were to say that this square over here is the exact same kind of pixel color as this square B here? A equals B. No. <laughs> You're crazy. It's true. Uh, we'll see it when we get to this chapter. You'll have to take my word for it right now. These are actually the exact same pixel color. And this tells us this most important lesson about perception, that we do not see the raw sensation. We do not see kind of the raw pixels that our eyes are perceiving and that are coming in from our you know, computer monitor or whatever. 
uh, we see the world. We make inferences. We make deep, powerful, uh, really intelligent, uh, good job, uh, inferences about what is happening in the world. These shadows, we infer a light source, the shadow, the, the continuation of this checkerboard pattern. Everything we're, we're, we're putting into that perception is just kind of automatic. It just happens but it really reflects a powerful amount of compression, also contrast to see those differences between those different regions um, in the way that we do. Uh, all of it reflects how, how those principles operate in the brain. Uh, here's some classic demonstrations of these points and also giving us a little bit of a sense of top-down control. So this famous dress example that was a viral sensation a few years back um, is, is really a demonstration of how our eyes and our visual system are trying to compensate for the ambient lighting to understand kind of what we're seeing. And the fact that this is just exactly balanced between these two different possible ways of perceiving it is just crazy. I can only see gold and, and white. Actually, uh, if I squint really hard, I think I can see it. Yeah, okay, well, anyway. Um, well, don't look at this one for too long. <laughs> Psychedelic spaghetti, oh boy. Uh, yeah, this is the output of the Google Deep Dream uh, neural network model. And what it's doing here is similar to what happens if you do happen to take a psychedelic drug. Um, it kind of uh, loosens up the, the kind of uh, perceptual system and makes it actually more susceptible kind of within the perceptual system to internal influences. Uh, we call this kind of top-down effects in perception. Um, and, and so, in fact, you know, where there was once just spaghetti and meatballs, <laughs> all these dogs start showing up because they kind of look like that. And then it's kind of imposing that top-down on those pixels. Um, and we see this every day, even if you're not on any kind of substance uh, with the, you know, seeing shapes in the clouds or on a convenient piece of toast or whatever. Um, so there's lots of demonstrations of how our top down and bottom up kind of dynamics work in perception. And we can understand a lot about that. Uh, this one, if you stare at it for too long, uh, um, uh, you can see it's moving. It's not actually moving. It's not a, a GIF. It's actually uh, just a static image, but the contrast yeah, between these different colors is driving this apparent motion in their action with your eyes moving. Um, so it's a really powerful demonstration of the effects of contrast and perception.